We started cycling together in October of 2019, unaware that it would become a journey. We had gone on a few rides together in the past, short leisurely ones that is, so the idea of taking up road cycling as a form of exercise was appealing. We thought that by getting into the sport we might be able to get our endurance miles in with less impact on our bodies compared to running, as we had previously done. After we got a few more rides under our belt, we realized that cycling was more than just exercise to us. There was also an adventure aspect. This allowed us to explore different areas around where we live, some of which we had never seen before. Despite the learning curve that any new road cyclist will experience, getting used to clipless pedals and the inevitable falls that come with them, learning the rules of the road and how to coexist with motor vehicles, figuring out how to utilize all the different gears and dealing with saddle discomfort, we became hooked. We found a new hobby that we both enjoyed, which allowed us to spend more time together. And that's about as good as it gets. Shortly after we got our feet wet, winter weather struck toward the end of November, and we had to put our outdoor rides on hold for a few months. We attempted one ride in sub-20 degree Fahrenheit temperatures, but it was not enjoyable, so we never did that again. We invested in two Concept2 bike ergs and began training indoors using Zwift. The training was unstructured as we experimented with different types of interval or steady state workouts. It was new and fun, but as we got further into the winter, we started looking ahead to 2020 and contemplated what our next step would be. We learned of these events called Grand Fondos, or big rides, that take place all over the world. We were intrigued by the concept of a long, organized group ride that is not a race, as we were more focused on increasing our mileage than our speed. We decided to register for the Vermont Grand Fondo scheduled for the end of June. Vermont is known for its green mountains, so we knew that this Fondo would have a lot of climbing, just a challenge we were looking for. Now, as for training, neither one of us had followed a structured training plan. We chose a Grand Fondo training plan that's offered through Training Peaks, which is 27 weeks long. The master's version of the plan would keep the weekly training hours below 10, which was about as much as we could fit around our work schedule. We experienced multiple ramp tests throughout our training, along with prescribed workouts such as sub-threshold, threshold, and maximum aerobic power efforts. The training was exclusively indoors for the first weeks, but thanks to a mild winter, we were able to start riding outside again in late January. In April, we were faced with an unfortunate reality when the coronavirus hit the country. Our home state of Connecticut went on a partial lockdown, allowing recreational outdoor activities to carry on. Additionally, the Vermont Grand Fondo was canceled. With our decision to not ride in the Vermont Fondo, we also had to decide what to do about our training. We had come too far to stop. We had made good progress with our fitness while following this training plan, and we were curious to see where it would take our fitness if we fit out. And we were determined to test ourselves with a big ride at the end. After all, finishing the training plan without doing a fondo size ride at the end would be like going through the school year, completing all the homework, and then skipping the final exam. That was not an option, so we decided we would create our own DIY Grand Fondo route and complete the ride at the end of our training. We named our DIY route CTGF, short for the Connecticut Grand Fondo. The main requirement for the route was to make the distance and elevation gain similar to that of the Vermont Grand Fondo. The route included two big climbs, Sager Mountain and Skiff Mountain. Sager Mountain is 4.3 miles and 882 feet of climbing with an average of 4.7%. Skiff Mountain is 3.3 miles and 918 feet of climbing with a 6.2% average grade. Both are Category 3 climbs. We begin from our home in Danbury and pass through the towns of New Fairfield, Sherman, Dover, Gaylordsville, Kent, Macedonia, New Milford, and Brookfield. According to Ride with GPS, it was planned to be 82 miles with 6,700 feet of climbing. That would bring us very close to the mileage and elevation gain of the Vermont Grand Fondo, which would have been 85 miles and 7,000 feet of climbing. Once we had the route finalized, it was just a matter of ensuring that our bikes and bodies were ready to go on game day. I had experienced mechanical issues with my bike due to a bent derailleur, but that was thankfully fixed through our local bike shop. 
With a light training week and our legs feeling fresh the day before the ride, the final step was to fuel ourselves. We ate a big dinner and set aside all of the food and drink that we would need to give us adequate nutrition during the ride. Our food sources were varied. Joy brought cliff bars, gels, and mini chocolate croissants, and I brought protein bars, bananas, a peanut butter and honey sandwich, a glazed donut, and a four ounce squeeze bottle of pure maple syrup. The basic idea was to take in 200 to 300 carb rich calories per hour during the ride. For hydration, we brought two bottles of electrolyte drink and three bottles of plain water between the two of us. After a solid night of sleep, we woke up on Sunday eager to start our ride. It is another Sunday morning. It is June 7th. I uh, yesterday celebrated my birthday. And so today is even more of a celebration because we are going to do our DIY Grand Fondo. It's the Connecticut Grand Fondo. Uh, since the Vermont Grand Fondo that we had signed up for and have been training for was canceled this year, we decided to continue with our training plan, finish it out, and do our own sort of DIY Grand Fondo uh, here around where, where we live uh, in Connecticut. So we're calling this the Connecticut Grand Fondo and it's only the two of us so not a big group ride. Yeah it'll be our, our biggest ride ever today and it's the one we've been training for for the last six months or so and uh, I think we're both feeling pretty good and, and ready to tackle it. So I think as long as we fuel properly, uh, we'll, we'll be good to go. Um, and I just want to say happy birthday to Joy, my beautiful and wonderful wife. Yesterday was actually her birthday, and it wasn't um, a big celebration, you know, due to the, the current situation with, with the virus and everything, but it was, it was nice because several family members stopped by our house individually uh, each to to bring uh, flowers or cards or, or gifts to joy for her birthday and to wish her a happy birthday so that was very nice so we had a good day yesterday and um, we're rested up and really excited to go today we departed the house at 7 16 in the morning in good spirits it was a cool morning 50 degrees fahrenheit with clear sunny skies the temperature would later reach the mid-70s, but a breeze of about 10 miles per hour would keep us from overheating during the ride. We headed north into New Fairfield, passing by Canterbury Lake on our right side with Squans Pond on our left. We stopped at Squans Pond for what would have been our first refueling, but we were still full from breakfast at that point. said that he had issues with his wheels so luckily I have the same exact wheel at home with my older bike and so I was just able to swap out his rear wheel uh, to the ones that I had because mine were still pretty good.
So we just took in some fluids while spending a few relaxing minutes by the water. We continued onward into Sherman, opting to climb Leech Hollow Road in Route 7. After passing through Sherman, we briefly touched New York as we went northwest into Dover before turning east and back into Connecticut. Upon our return into Connecticut, we stopped in Gaylordsville at the Bulls Bridge hiking trail area for our first refueling. This time, it was necessary to eat as we would be approaching our first big climb soon. Several miles on bumpy South Kent Road gave us the opportunity to think about the upcoming Sager Mountain, which would be our first big climb of the day. Our heart rates elevated slightly as we felt the road underneath us start to rise. We proceeded up the southern side of Sager Mountain, trying to hold a steady, moderate pace in our sub-threshold zone. The max grade on Sager is between 15 and 20 percent. Not severely steep, but the climb seemed to last forever. Under 27 minutes, we reached the top and took a break. We were not hungry yet, but forced ourselves to eat. So first climb, it's category three climb done for the ride. Sager Mountain, three miles or so. Jason said it wasn't hard. I thought it was. <laughs> uh, so here he is. I mean, it was it was moderately hard. I I don't think it was you know crazy hard, but it was very long. It seemed like it just wasn't going to end, but um, it, it wasn't too steep. So I I don't struggle that much when the grades are are not. You know, when the grades get over ten percent, I struggle. But I don't think there was I don't think there was uh, a whole lot of. Um, over 10% grade there. I think it was probably a lot that was between 5 and 10%. So that's kind of, that's in my, my tolerance zone. Uh, so that, that was, uh, it was a tough, it was a tough long one, but it's, uh, we handled it. So my issue was not being able to fuel properly in the previous rides. Now I am fueling and I feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> so I can't seem to to win. Like, I'm gonna like, I don't want to fuel again because before the Skiff Mountain. So I'm just gonna drink a lot and hopefully I don't puke halfway up Skiff. We knew the keys to success on this ride would be moderate pacing and staying on top of our nutrition. We descended Saker Mountain on the northern side then looped around to the west and connected to Route 7 heading toward downtown Kent. It was tempting to stop at a coffee shop, but we forged ahead. We were on a mission and our next big climb was right down the road.
It was not time to relax yet. After crossing over the Housatonic River, we began our ascent up Skiff Mountain Road, our second big climb of the day. This was the southern side of Skiff Mountain. We were familiar with the terrain as we've descended this side of Skiff a few times before. It doesn't waste any time before punching you in the face, or should I say, the quads. The first mile was an average grade of 9%, with max grades over 20%, and main stretches of over 15%. Keeping this part of the climb at sub-threshold power was just not possible. We needed to pedal with near full force in order to keep moving forward. The climb did ease up a bit after the first mile, but at that point our legs were already flooded with lactate, and there was no clearing that out until we reached the top. So we had to pedal with rubber legs for the last two miles. <laughs> We were relieved to reach the top of Skiff, knowing the hardest part of the ride was now behind us. We treated ourselves to a much needed rest and snack near the Kent School campus. We're here on top of uh, Skiff Mountain now. <clears throat> I am almost done with climbing. It is, luckily that's our last category three climb and then we cut we have a few more steep but short climbs fell off my bike and uh, scraped to my knee because I was trying to clip in and it was like a slight incline on the road oh, my knee. yeah we just finished that skiff mountain climb that was I thought that was tougher than uh, than Sager or at least in the sense that it was it was pretty steep in the beginning. Um, I went pretty hard in the beginning and then kind of went just moderate the rest of the way. I, I sort of remembered Skiff because we came down on it a few times. So I remembered um, that it was, it was gonna be steep at the beginning and then it was kind of gradual after that. Um, but yeah, that was the, that was the second uh, second category three climb today, and that's I think the last the last big one. I think the rest of the rest of the way is just some some shorter climbs. Uh, we're at we're at around 5,300 feet of climbing so far, um, and we're 51 or 52 miles into the ride. So I guess we have the majority of the climbing done. Um, the majority of the hard climbing. Yeah. So. Morale is. How's morale? Thirsty. Thirsty? Well, I have, I have lots of I water. Did, I just drank water. I just don't, I my, don't. my morale is high because I just ate my glazed donut, and uh, so I saved that as my treat for, uh, for the top of this mountain. So uh, that was yummy. It was nice and cool up there, the highest point being 1,300 feet. 
the breeze provided a natural fan to cool us down after the intense effort. At this point, we reflected upon our morale. It remained high because we realized that we still felt pretty good and that we had enough gas left in the tank to finish the ride strong. However, I was struggling mentally to keep going. My legs felt great, but the saddle discomfort as a result of heavy training led to thoughts of uncertainty. Once I acknowledged the source of my discomfort and accepted the fact that there was nothing I could do about it, I moved on from it mentally and got on the bike. We descended the mountain via Fuller Mountain Road, heading south through Macedonia and back into Kent. South would be the general direction for the remainder of the route. We passed through downtown Kent again, connected to South Kent Road, and followed that road through Gaylordsville and into New Milford. In New Milford, we hopped onto River Road, which is a dirt road that runs alongside the Housatonic River. River Road was busier than usual, with both runners and cyclists, as well as parked cars of people who were likely fishing. But we found a quiet spot under the shade of the tree-lined road to stop and refuel. So we're here at River Road. Um, we've stopped here before, but this is a little uh, different place. Hey. Um, different place than what we normally uh, stopped at and that's because it's a little more shaded here in this spot and we can kind of lean the, the bikes on a tree up against a tree um, so I have run out of water uh, both bottles have been out thankfully Jason brought three uh, bottles of water with him and so he was able to uh, give me some water but um, yeah, I think I'm going to switch over to just plain water for now. I did bring some electrolytes, but I'm going to switch over to just plain water so that, um, I don't know, I just feel like I am super thirsty. It looks like we have about 15 miles to go. We're about 67 miles into the ride, 6,000 feet of climbing so far. And uh, yeah, fatigue is starting to set in at this point. I don't know. I don't know if Joy would agree with me on that, and if, at least as far as I'm concerned, fatigue is starting to set in, but with only 15 miles left, I think we got it. We can do this. Oh, groin pain is... Oh, groin, groin pain is severe at this point. It's, uh, that's actually the worst, the worst thing that we're experiencing right now is the groin pain. I'm at 8 out of 10. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Um... But we'll get through it and uh, it's still fun though glad we're doing this this is uh, all of our training being put to use starting to run low on water at this point. While we likely had enough left to finish the ride, it would be close, coming down to the last drop. From River Road, we connected to Route 7 South, heading toward Brookfield. We could start to smell victory now, as we had only 15 miles remaining, but there was one last climb we had to deal with. Candlewood Lake Road, a Category 4 that's about 3 quarters of a mile long, with 9% average grade. This one didn't worry us because we've done it many times before, so it was only a question of how hard we would go on it. We caught a second wind mid-climb and went for a PR. Unfortunately, neither of us got one. We came up a few seconds short. After the climb, we stopped alongside Candlewood Lake for one final break and refueling. We were sipping our water at this point because there wasn't enough left for gulps. Now it was time for the home stretch. Okay, it's a little windy here, but we're stopped at uh, Candlewood Lake, um, we, our normal spot that we usually stop at. And I did something very silly. I attempted a PR at Candlewood Lake Road, which I almost got. I missed it by two seconds. Uh, that's a bummer, but I felt good though, because um, knowing that we've done so far 6,800 feet of climbing and we still
still have about 10 miles or so left to go uh, until we get home. So we're almost in the home stretch. Yeah, it's pretty exciting that we're on the home stretch here. Um, you can see the finish line and uh, it's a familiar route the rest of the way, so we should have no problem with it. Uh, however, um, we, we did, we are almost out of water. I only have one sip left, which I'm saving in case of emergency. And uh, went through almost all of the food that I brought. We put our sore butts back on a saddle and rode off. It would be smooth sailing from there as we took in views of Candlewood Lake to our right. We started thinking about the fact that we had been gone for almost eight hours and that our dogs were hungry. While that was true, our boy Rudy had probably been enjoying his time on the living room furniture. Our girl Maggie is too small to jump up, so she was probably enjoying her time with her beloved dog bed all to herself. Still, we missed the pups, and we were glad to be on our way home to them. As we coasted onto our street and pulled up our driveway, it hit us. We did it. We completed our grand fondo with a smile on our face singing Queen's Bicycle Race. The sense of accomplishment didn't really hit us at that moment because it was like any normal ride, which proved that our hard work and consistent training paid off.